Hello everyone, it's Silver. This is Time Melters. So this is, well, it's technically a real-time strategy, just in a very unusual way. So the closest games I can think of to compare this to would be shiny entertainment's games like uh, Giant Citizens Kabuto and Sacrifice, which is a comparison that I always like to make because Sacrifice is one of my favorite old games. I think it's a fantastic underrated gem, but you don't get to compare games to those very often because it's mechanically a super unusual way to do things. So the idea here is you are a witch, sort of, and you have to protect this area from an incursion of these sort of demonic-like entities and undead and stuff as well. And uh, you do so by both combining your sort of magic, your just general powers, and also the ability to create time loops. So it is in the kind of third-person shooter sort of uh, scenario, but you can also at any time press a button to zoom up and get more of a strategy game layout of everything. Actually, you have two different buttons that do that, uh, one of which pauses the game and allows you to get a good layout and, you know, plan ahead, and the other one does not pause the game but allows you to actually interact with things very far away from yourself. So first off though, the presentation. Visually, the game is relatively simple looking. It's not gonna win any like incredible photorealistic texture awards, but I don't think that's the point. And uh, I think it actually looks quite good from a pure art direction standpoint because of its use of color as magic. You know, basically uh, this game has a somewhat desaturated feel to its environments, but they have a nice sort of simple shading to them that makes them look quite good. But when it comes to anything magical, whether good or bad, it's a bright color. You know, most of your magic is a bright blue or a dark purple, and then a lot of the enemies glow in various bright colors. And then you also sometimes have some friendlies that can help you out, and oftentimes they have some particle effects and stuff associated with them that are quite bright. So it does this interesting thing where it contrasts from the relatively desaturated environments with these really bright, colorful particle effects and spell effects and things that uh, creates, in my opinion at least, a pretty nice looking art style when it all comes together. Another thing worth mentioning, in my opinion, is the music. The music is quite good in this game. Uh, it's a bit difficult to, in my opinion at least, it would be a bit difficult to make music for a game like this because it needs to be, you know, action-y, upbeat, but it also needs to not be distracting because you're doing action-y, upbeat, third-person shooter style of things, but you're also in this strategy layer planning ahead, so you don't want the music to be, like, completely super bombastic all the time, or it might be sort of distracting when you're trying to play chess, but when you're not playing chess and you're back down and the troop scale of things, you do want some, you know, fantasy clashing instruments and things. And I think the game strikes a good medium and its music is a little bit zen, a little bit chill, but still upbeat and kind of combat focused because most of what you're doing in this game is combat. So this means that you do have some moments of exploration and stuff before missions start and the music is more calm in those areas. It's sort of a fantasy wanderlust kind of thing. But then once it gets into the actual main levels themselves, You've got some really solid music that makes for a good sort of strategic background without being too distracting or taking away from anything. And uh, I think it is something that should be pointed out because, like I said, it's not necessarily easy to create a soundtrack for a very mixed genre game like this. So the way the game is structured is it's mission-based. You will go from mission to mission in a linear order. And uh, there aren't any like side quests or anything like that, although the missions do tend to vary their objectives a fair amount and give you some unique scenarios to work within, so each mission does feel different. There are these very hard challenge maps that you'll unlock as you go through the game, and these challenge maps have some really specific goals and often really test your mechanical knowledge of the game, but they are enjoyable. I'm just not very good at them. So when you get to a mission, you will go into the map, oftentimes have some sort of introductory cutscene, maybe do a little bit of exploration and wondering just to sort of get you to where you need to be. And then the battle itself will start. And battles always start paused. They start in the strategic pause view, which allows you to get a good overview of the map and see what's going on. In this overview, you will see big images representing each enemy group, and they'll have numbers next to them that tell you how many of that enemy is in that group, so you know at a glance. And uh, each enemy group will also have a colored line that shows the direction and path that they're taking to get to wherever they want to go, which is usually straight to you or to a, an NPC that you have to protect. And uh, this gives it a bit of a tower defense vibe, not in the strictest sense, this is definitely not a tower defense, but I think you can see some clear inspirations from the genre and how the game is structured, especially because a lot of the maps can get kind of tall and narrow, like a tower defense map where you are sort of mazing your enemies, although the opportunities for mazing in this game are limited, but present in a lot of maps. 
And what you gotta do is survive. Just make it to the end. And if there are any NPCs on the map, you have to protect all of them, generally speaking. I don't think I've ever seen a mission where you could let any of them die. You do have to actually save them all. So you're going to use this sort of initial pause view that you can return to at any time to get a good overview of the map, but also to see where the enemies are coming from and also kind of look at which ones are going to arrive first because, you know, some of the enemies are going to be closer than others and uh, they're going to be more relevant at first to actually take out. You have a limited movement speed in this game. It's not exactly slow, but it's not super fast either. And uh, you've got to be careful about the amount of distance you need to cover. And there are also these things called void stones around the map that are teleportation uh, points. And these are really cool because they don't have a load screen. You just immediately teleport into the void and then teleport out to wherever the exit is in like a really smooth fashion. It's pretty cool. And uh, all of them are connected to each other on a map so you can go in between the wherever they are nice and quick. Although you have to actually reach them to activate them first until eventually you will get the void spirit spell, which allows you to spend some resources to activate all of them on the map at once from anywhere. Now, one of the primary bits of strategy in an RTS is resources. You've got to find out where the resources are on the map and how to exploit them and how to keep your uh, miners and stuff from getting killed by the enemies and all that stuff. And this game does use a version of that, although instead of making miners, you have these spirit and soul resources. They're actually two different things. Spirits are blue, souls are purple. And these are extremely important resources because you need them to fuel your various spells. Everything except for your basic attack pretty much takes some of these resources. And uh, they are going to be sometimes just flying around the map in specific points and you have to get close enough to them for them to sort of vacuum towards you so you do have to actually get to where they are in order to collect them. But also you'll find a lot of enemy groups will have a blue circle or a purple diamond next to their number that shows you that some of them have this resource and will drop it when they're killed. So those enemy groups act as resource drops. In essence, every mission in this game is actually a puzzle. A somewhat open-ended puzzle that usually has multiple solutions, although there are a couple that have a very specific solution only. But uh, the uh, game actually rates every mission in terms of combat difficulty and puzzle difficulty out of 10 as separate scores to let you know. And higher combat difficulty usually means more enemies, denser groups of enemies, more variety of enemies, things like that. Whereas higher puzzle difficulty implies that you need to use more specific tactics and be quite uh, have some finesse with them in order to succeed. So you have two different spell sets in this game. You'll only start with one at first, the blue one that uses uh, spirits as a resource, and it has a basic sort of repeating blast spell that does fair damage but is relatively slow, and uh, you have to stop firing it for it to recharge. It will run out of ammo and need to sort of reload. And uh, it doesn't take long, but it takes long enough for enemies to close the distance between you, so you got to be careful because something I haven't mentioned yet, you die in one hit in this game. Uh, anything that touches you, you're dead. But the blue magic set also has some really useful spells, like the ability to infuse one spirit into something to activate it. You can in infuse a spirit into a tree to cause it to grab enemies and throw them around, and each one will destroy five enemies that go past it, so allowing you to thin ranks. And if there are multiple trees in the way, then you can take out entire groups of enemies with them, especially if you have some of the other things you can infuse, like the uh, lesser moonstones, which are your way of mazing or pathing enemies. They block areas when you use them. So you you can use them to uh, kind of choose what paths you want the enemies to take by activating certain ones. You can also summon a fire spirit, which uh, is a good distraction. It dies in one hit as well, but it does a lot of damage for a while, and it will pull all the aggro of an entire enemy group that sees it which allows you to control where enemy groups go because you can take them off of their normal path by uh, pulling them to different areas with these spirits. You've also got an earth spirit that will root several enemies in place for quite a long time and keep them from moving entirely, which can be hugely useful in certain areas, especially if you want to separate groups apart or pick out specific problem enemies and uh, isolate them. And then at a certain point in the game, you'll face a pretty fun boss fight, and after you beat this boss, you'll absorb them and get their power, which is basically death magic. This is the purple magic, and uh, it uses souls as a resource, and its basic attack is a death beam, which is really strong. It does a lot of damage very quickly, and uh, can uh, chew through even large crowds of enemies really fast. However, it does not recharge like your blue basic attack does. Instead, the only way to get it back is to absorb more souls. Every time you absorb a purple soul, you get a little chunk of it back. So the soul resources become very important because they allow you to recharge this basic but powerful attack. 
And some of the things you can use these souls for, once you've got them, the other purple magic powers, are things like possession, uh, making a group of enemies fight for you pretty much permanently. It causes them to lose health quickly, but uh, they will fight for you until they die. You can infuse boneyards with a spirit in order to get uh, some friendly skeletons that will fight for you, which is really handy. They tend to pull aggro from a pretty good distance. And you also get a couple of others that are very timing based. You have to use them at the right time, but are extremely powerful if you do. One of them is an orb that you can fire your basic attacks into, either one, and it will increase the damage like twice as much. Basically, it doubles it and it sends the attacks all in a scatter and they home in on enemies. So you can use your death beam on it and it'll shoot a bunch of death beams down at a crowd of enemies, or you can shoot your normal projectiles at it and it will shower them around any enemies near it. It's extremely powerful and it travels a really long distance. And you've also got the Wrath spell, which is cool because it causes the sky to darken. It actually makes it storm, but it uh, doubles your damage for everything. So it makes you a complete powerhouse and it turns your uh, basic attacks into like a sort of crackly orange lightning effectively. And yeah, they're extremely powerful, but only for a short period of time. All of these spells have quite a long cooldown, by the way, so you have to manage cooldowns effectively in this game. You also have a teleport that you can place anywhere, and whenever you have a teleport placed, you'll see a glowing blue sort of bracelet of magic on your left arm, which is a nice touch. Uh, this is just a way to let you know you have one active. At any time, you can hold the teleport button, and you'll teleport right back to wherever you set it, or you will automatically teleport back to it if you get hit in order to prevent you from dying. However, where things get really interesting and where the game's namesake comes from, you also have time loops. So you do have some time powers and you'll see some sort of orangey golden uh, rings of energy on your right arm. And this represents how many loops you can create. At any time, you can hold right on the D-pad and it will rewind you back to the start of the mission, but your previous self will still do whatever it is you did. So you basically are constantly recording a set of actions. So if you sweep through and clear the entire left side of the map with your first character, I guess you could say, then you can loop back and then your uh, the sort of echo of your first character will still go and do that and it will clear it out. The enemies will behave exactly the same as they did in the uh, first loop, which means as long as you did clear it out successfully and you don't distract the enemies with your second echo by doing something else, making them change uh, what they're doing in the present, then everything will happen exactly as it happened before. So you need to use this in order to be in multiple places at once literally and actually uh, eventually cover the map in terms of all the tactics that you're using to uh, destroy everything because it's very unlikely that you'll be able to destroy everything with just one sort of life you have to make multiple echoes having multiple of past versions of yourselves on the map doing their own things all at once in order to succeed these also act as your extra lives uh, if you don't have a teleport active. Well, actually, they'll they'll be used before a teleport generally. But yeah, before you uh, expend your teleport, you will automatically get the chance to rewind whenever you are to take damage. So uh, these do act as like extra lives, but you need to make sure to use them all efficiently because in order to complete most of these maps, you are going to need to use all of your echoes as effectively as possible. Your echoes can actually work together as well. Like if one of your echoes casts that death orb, then future versions of you can still shoot at it and get its benefit, even though a past version of you cast it. The same goes for that Wrath spell that makes you super powerful. Whenever one of your past selves casts Wrath, it also affects all of your future selves at that same period of time. So if you can time it right, you can have a bunch of yourselves at once gain the benefit from it and get super powerful attacks for a while. This means that the strategy for this game is kind of abstract and takes a little bit of getting used to, but is really compelling once you actually get into it. Once you figure out what it wants from you and how to use these spells and things all correctly and how they interact with each other and how they interact with the future or the past, it starts to all come together into a really unique package. And I don't think I've ever played anything quite like Time Melters as a result. It's a unique blend of strategy, sort of magic, third person shooting and time shenanigans means that that you are always trying to come up with creative solutions for your problems and oftentimes you have to. This is a game that is pretty difficult in my opinion and the difficulty mostly comes from the game's demand that you learn how to use its mechanics effectively. If you're not comfortable with how the time looping stuff works and the creation of echoes and making them work together, then you're not going to succeed in most of the missions because you really need to be quite good at it in order to enact the strategies that it's going to expect from you. 
There's also, by the way, an entire grid of spell upgrades that will affect all of your various abilities and improve them in different ways, although you can only select a small number of these, and exactly when you can select one is determined by the story. There's not like an experience gauge or anything like that. It's just something that happens at specific points, so you can't expect to use very many of them at a time, but they are quite powerful and uh, fun to amass because they can change how a lot of your spells work in a big enough way to make you change how you use them tactically. Overall, I think Time Melters is a really solid strategy game because it does something that I've never quite seen like this, and it does it quite well. Uh, it's kind of rare to see a game be the first at something, or at least be relatively new at something, and s manage to do it to a good degree of competence, but Time Melters does do that. It is a very competent strategy game with a really unique set of mechanics. If you enjoy RTS or third-person shooters, then there's probably something here for you to like because of what it does. It's kind of a, a large range of different mechanics available. And if you are a fan of the idea of battles being like big puzzles, then this will definitely appeal to you. I would say this is equally a puzzle game as it is a strategy game. It's just because the puzzle aspect of the levels is key to how the strategy works, so they are melded together very well. And uh, I think that the, the fusion, the combination of those two things, of strategy and puzzle, is always fun whenever it pops up. So I have an easy time recommending Time Melters, uh, bad pun detected, because it's just interesting and fun and uh, there's a lot to it and I think for the price that it demands for its content it's pretty fair so I would recommend it yeah definitely and I think that like I said if you're a fan of more of like the puzzly aspect of games like this then this is gonna really have you scratching your head at times because some of the strategies that it makes you learn are a bit unusual because of this uh, time manipulation mechanic uh, making you able to do some really interesting things that you otherwise might not think of so I'll put the link in the description below this video to the Steam Store page for Time Melters so that you can go and check it out yourselves. Thank you guys very much for watching, and I'll see you next time.